on the 30th of January, one of the flying boats called Karaya was approaching uh, Kupang and uh, there were Japanese aircraft mounting an air raid over Dutch Timor at the time and a couple of Zeros found Karaya and shot it down into the sea. Welcome to the Damcasters, brought to you in association with the Pima Air and Space Museum. I'm your host, Matt Bowen. Welcome to the final part of what is now our three-part look at the Empire Flying Boats, the wonderful Shorts C-Class Imperial and Qantas Airways Flying Boats. Now, we're right in the middle of the outbreak of war in our conversation with Phil Vabre, who is the president of the Civil Aviation Historical Society in Australia and the boss of the excellent Airways Museum at Essendon Airport. This week, we're going to start delving into just how quickly everything starts to fall apart what happens in Australia, and also looking into the specifics around the disappearance of one of the C-class boats named Circe, which Phil did a lot of research to find out what actually happened. So without further ado, we're going to dive straight back into our conversation with Phil and find out just how quickly events are moving in the Pacific. Being an ex-ops chap, I can just sort of see that the the working on the hoof to to keep services going through this it it, was there ever discussions to just stop these services or was it always keep as much going for as long as possible um while the situation um because you know we're talking we're talking weeks here aren't we you know it's not a long period of time that the japanese are are rushing south so it's it's very much on the fly was there ever a discussion just to to stop pull everything back you're absolutely right. It was under three months from kind of uh, the start of the Pacific War to when things really terminated or that phase of the war terminated. Um, so a really very compressed time frame. Um, there wasn't any plan to stop services. The, the whole thing was to try and keep it going as long as possible. And the reason was that the Empire flying boats were the ho- the only what we would call um, heavy airlift capability in the Empire. Um, mm. You know, the, the British Empire at that stage didn't have a great deal in the way of you know the RAF or the RAAF didn't have much in the way of transport aircraft, and these flying boats were the only heavy lift air transport that they had, and they had to keep going. That was basically it. Plus, the fact of you know needing means of transporting communications. Um, you know, letters and dispatches and people and that sort of thing for military purposes. There, there just wasn't any alternative. So it took a lot of effort to piece all this together. And I will give a shout out at this point too to a friend of mine, um, Paul Sheehan, who has done a lot of research uh, as well on the Empire flying boats. And uh, he's just a machine, a research machine. He's dug out a lot of great information. But luckily, uh, it took quite a while to find them. But the Airline movement charts for all of these aircraft still exist. The BIAC, uh, BIAC kept records of where all their aircraft were on huge big graphs. So they could see at any particular point in time where the aircraft was, uh, where each aircraft was. And remember, they had dozens of aircraft in their fleet. Um, and so these charts still exist and they're, they're an absolutely uh, invaluable historical record. Anyway, suffice to say that those three months were just a complete shambles, really. Um, As you said, uh, the situation changed from day to day. There were times when nobody really knew who was in charge in particular places or who was calling the shots. Um, And there were frequent changes of routes and times and all the rest of it. So uh, from an operations point of view... um, it was amazing that they managed to get as much done as they did. Um, and I you know, tip my hat to the people who were orchestrating all of that. That's why you always have your best people in ops. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. <laughs> exactly. So, uh, yeah, they, they did a, a pretty good job all around. And as I said, they you know, were responding at short notice to the military situation. The other thing that survives, which is amazing, in the Qantas uh, archives, 
uh, which I found were things called the Captain's General Reports. So at the end of each trip, the captain would write a report of what had happened on that trip. And they are also enormously valuable historical record, and they haven't got them for, for uh, their entire services, but just for this period, they all still exist. Uh, and they describe some incredible things like, you know, they'd be flying along and they'd get over the radio and because they had to maintain radio silence on the flying boats, but the ground stations would broadcast uh, air raid warnings and so on, and they would look for a little bay or something that they could duck into and uh, wait out the air raid. And uh, even then they would often report seeing Japanese aircraft flying overhead and just hope that, that they weren't seen because uh, they, no, they're pretty vulnerable either in the air or on the water. And by this point, they've all been repainted in camouflage on the top surfaces and, and, and things like that. Yeah, the Empire flying boats were, were camouflaged early on uh, in the war. Um, but still, you know. <laughs> They're not the most inconspicuous things at the best of times, yeah. No. Um, you know, one, one thing people don't often think about, uh, you know, all the service people, you know, obviously they were all exposed to danger and so on, but they, they all got recognition, they got their medals and, uh, you know, pensions and all the rest of it. People of civil aviation, by and large, didn't get any of that recognition, and yet the dangers that they uh, faced in many respects were as great as the, the dangers that service people faced. And, you know, they did it with comparatively very little thanks or recognition, and I think that's something we need to, to think about more. We're sort of getting getting to the point where the flying boats – that are operating these routes, you're saying that, that they're ducking in to avoid raids and things, they don't stay unscathed for, for long, do they? That they, they start bumping into the Japanese um, quite early on. Indeed, they don't. And, and actually, the first um, Empire flying boat lost uh, out in this part of the world, the, the world at that point was a BOAC-operated one. So, as I said, Qantas were operating through to Karachi, but um, the IAC were tasked with running uh, an extra service down to um, uh, the Netherlands East Indies. They were transporting some stuff down there and people, and uh, they actually crashed the aircraft taking off at Sabang, or, which is in the, on Sumatra. Um, and that was the first of the aircraft loss, but that was an accident. They were taking off at um, pretty high weights as well. That's another thing um, that was going on was the aircraft were being operated at uh, max takeoff weight or even in some cases a bit above max takeoff weight just because they had the, the, the necessity to do it and you know, it was an emergency. Um, so uh, that was in December of 1941. In January, the end of January, 30th of January, um, the Japanese had come a long way south. Java was still holding out. Um, Singapore was still uh, holding out. But the Japanese had come down to uh, Ambon, which was north of Timor in the sort of eastern end of the Netherlands, East Indies. And they were operating aircraft out of there over Timor. Remember, I said that Timor at that stage was occupied by Dutch and uh, Australian uh, troops and the air route was still going up from Australia from Darwin up to Kupang in Western Timor and then uh, and also Delhi then. Um, well actually the Delhi service was suspended in late January as well so they were just going through Kupang uh, and then across to um, uh, Bima which is an island uh, sort of the eastern end of Java, and then up through Java. Um, on the 30th of January, one of the flying boats called Karayo was approaching uh, Kupang, and uh, there were Japanese aircraft mounting an air raid over Dutch Timor at the time, and a couple of Zeros found Karayo and shot it down into the sea uh, south of um, Timor. Uh, the captain of the flying boat, a uh, bloke by the name of Orb Koch, he had a, an incredible career actually, Orb. Uh, 
but uh, he uh, tried to dodge the fighters and the, the bullets, but um, to no avail. They were they shot into the sea. They crashed the aeroplane. Um, some of the passengers were killed on the impact, but a lot of them got out, and a uh, few of them were able to swim to shore. Some of them drowned after they got out of the, the flying boat. Um, uh, Orb Kosh himself, I think, had, uh, if I remember right, he had a bullet wound in his knee, um, but he was a champion swimmer, um, and he was able to make it to shore along with some of the other people, and they set up a little camp on the beach, and then um, one of the chaps uh, was able to eventually walk uh, down the coastline and find a village and alert people to the fact that they were there and they were rescued off the, the beach. So it was a bit of a disaster and the Australian authorities, because remember, only six, well, Australia only owned six of these flying boats and Corio was one of those. And uh, between Imperial Airways and Qantas, there weren't that many of them. Uh, and we couldn't really afford to lose important aircraft like that. So the Australian Department of Civil Aviation, as they'd become by then, uh, told Qantas that they had to move their service uh, to the west to avoid going through Timor. So there'd also been some pre-planning done on that as well. And um, the uh, they ended up, Qantas moved their operations west to Broome, which is on the northwest Australian coast. And uh, the plan was to operate services up to a port on the southern coast of Java called Chilichap. Um, now, it was a much longer flight than the uh, Darwin to Kupang leg. And so payloads were obviously going to be uh, quite reduced. But the importance of keeping the um, service open sort of overrode any thoughts about abandoning at that point. Um, so Broome itself was a, a real problem. Broome's a, uh, quite a large harbour, but very shallow water, and the tides um, in that part of the world are huge. They're about 15 feet uh, tides. So when the tide went out at Broome, you had sort of acres and acres and acres of mud flats before you got to the water. And when the tide came in, uh, you know, it was sort of lapping at the, the top of the pier kind of thing. Um, and that posed enormous problems of, of uh, you know, how do you moor these aeroplanes? How do you refuel them? Because all the fuel had to be taken out in drums. There was no uh, tanks. You know, we talked about tanks yesterday, and, you know, in part one. Uh, at the permanent flying boat bases, but at Broome there was no fuel tank, so everything had to be carted out on a, a boat. They had to commandeer boats. Um, I took the masts off one boat so it could go under the wing of the, the flying boat. Um, one of the advanced features of the Empire flying boats, actually, which I, I don't think I'd talk about in part one, was it had what today we would call single-point pressure refueling. So it had a coupling on the side of the hull, and... Uh, this is in the pre-war service. The Shell refueling boats they had the contract to do the refueling. They would they had a tank and a, a pump on the boat, and they would come alongside, couple up to this uh, cock on the side of the hull, and they would pump the fuel in uh, through that cock, and it would go up into the tanks of the aircraft. So you could refuel it from sea level, basically. Um, they also had over wing refueling, which meant you had to take a hose up to the top of the wing and pump it in that way, or drums, or or whatever. Obviously, the single point pressure refueling is a much more faster and efficient way of refueling. But that's something we didn't see on commercial aircraft for many, many years after the war. It wasn't a standard sort of thing. So that was one of the advanced uh, features of the Empire boats. But at Broome, of course, they didn't have any of those launches, so they had to do all their refueling over the wing and by hand pumped, uh, you know, coming out of 44 gallon drums. So I guess that's where the, the leading edge walkways and things like that come in quite handy for, for, for that sort of, that sort of refueling. 
Uh, well, actually, you don't need the walkways because you could get out of the aeroplane. There was a hatch sort of in the above the centre section, mm, okay. and you could yeah. get out onto the wing and and refuel from that way. But you know, obviously, a lot more time consuming and difficult than mm. doing it. Uh, I remember you're out on the water, the aeroplanes jumping around. You know, it can't kind have of been very pleasant, especially in bad weather. And in fact. There was a cyclone came through Broome at, at pretty much that time, which knocked out some of the telegraph lines and so on, and also created havoc with getting the, the service up and running. So it was about uh, a week or a week and a half, I think, of <coughs> delay before they could uh, start up the service again, and then it was just purely from the logistics of getting things sorted out at Broome. Um, in I the meantime... Group- Broom up. It's okay, it's come. it's it's well to the the west of Darwin, isn't it? So it's it's quite a way round the round the coast in northern Western Australia. Oh yeah, it's a long way from Darwin. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Just um, just to put it in context for for people like me that don't know that part of Australia as well. Everybody knows the bits the bits on either edge, but the bit along the top is sort of. I guess to put it in a European context is probably about the same distance as maybe London to almost not Berlin but somewhere in Germany anyway away from Darwin so yeah long 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 distance it's not not close by any means um especially you know when you're traveling a lot slower than we do today yeah so anyway yeah Broom they finally got uh, things going and it, at this stage too um the Japanese were really pressing the Netherlands East Indies they'd started their invasion of Java or Sumatra in particular, and um, uh, there was a need to maintain communications, but also a need to evacuate people out of the Netherlands East Indies. So KLM, oh, sorry, KNILM had their fleet of aeroplanes in the Netherlands East Indies, and they were using them on shuttle services uh, to Australia. Uh, the US military forces had by this stage arrived a lot of them had escaped out of the Philippines, come down to Australia. Some more had arrived by uh, ship from the US. No, I think uh, there were US forces have been sent to the Philippines and then because the Philippines fell so quickly, had to be diverted down to Australia. Anyway, uh, they were trying to get people in and out of Java as well. So they, there were there was a lot of activity at Broome, both flying boats of all stripes. So there was... Dutch flying boats, there was RAF and US Navy flying boats, and there was also um, obviously the civil flying boats, so all operating out of Broom Harbour, just to add to the fusion. And also there was a lot of activity at the Broom Aerodrome, the land aerodrome, with uh, military aircraft of all stripes and, and plus civil land planes like the KLM, KNILM flight, uh, fleet flying backwards and forwards. So Broome suddenly became a, a hugely busy place. Um, so that went on for about um, two weeks with these uh, flights back and forward to Chilichap. Uh, both Qantas was basically doing one a day, so they'd fly out and back, or sometimes I'd fly out it one day and then stay overnight, come back early the next day. So the first service was on the 22nd of February. The last was on the 28th of February. The 27th of February, they ran two flying boats for the first time over to Chilichap. Both of them moored overnight. And then first thing in the morning, they uh, started off to come back to Broome. So the, there was two of them. The Circe was one. And uh, uh, I forgot what the other one was. Uh, Karina, I think, maybe. Uh, so this is... This is also about a week after the the bombing of Darwin as well, isn't it? So the, the Japanese are in the area. Yeah. Well, actually, I hadn't talked about the bombing of Darwin, and that's that's another interesting story, but I'll, I'll just finish the cello chap. Things are popping to my head, and they're spilling out, so you, you, you do your <laughs> thing. <laughs> no, you're right. The, the problem is there was so much going on in this mm. period, and things in different places, that it, it's hard to get it all sort of into one narrative sequence. We're going to take a quick break so that we can get the latest from the Pima Air and Space Museum with Head of Collections, Andrew Bowley. Here at the Pima Air and Space Museum with our Douglas A20G Havoc, 
Um, the A-20 Havoc was an attack aircraft light bomber of World War II. Um, originally built and designed with a glass nose with a bombardier. Um, in the Pacific Theater, like B-25s, Pappy Gunn came up with this idea of manning these aircraft with solid noses and a bunch of machine guns for doing strafing attacks on Japanese airfields and attacking Japanese shipping. Um, this aircraft is an actual combat veteran. It flew with the 89th Bomb Squadron in New Guinea uh, on a mission, uh, I think bombing WeWAC. It was damaged and made an emergency landing in a swamp in New Guinea. The crew was recovered and the aircraft sat there pretty much forever until it was found in the 80s and in the early 90s it was recovered by the Royal Australian Air Force. This A-20 with another one that they had, um, they restored the one Helen Pelican which was another combat veteran from the Pacific. Um, they used a lot of the parts from this aircraft for that aircraft. Then actually went to a civilian owner and then we ended up buying from that civilian owner and finished up the restoration put it on display here. Uh, it's a unique. It's a unique aircraft in the fact there's only about four, if I recall, A-20 Havocs anywhere on display in the world, um, with one in a private collection, one at the Air Force Museum, one here, and one in a private collection in Russia. But uh, I'd say it's always been one of my favorite aircraft. I think just because of the, you know, lack of them as survivors, and also just seeing a lot of those cool photos from World War II where you see these A-20s coming in low over a ball bombing Japanese cruisers and, and transports and you know they're like literally flying right like at mass height over these ships um, so I just always found it to be a pretty cool airplane. To learn more about what is on display and what events are coming up at the Pima Air and Space Museum in Tucson, Arizona, please do check out their website at www.pimaair.org. And now, back to the show. That's the thing we tend to, because we think of the Pacific as you know years of island hopping, but at this point in time, it's weeks and days that the entire situation can change it. Oh, look, it was changing hourly in, in a lot of respects. Um, yeah, I mean, hugely confusing period for the people, you know, trying to live through it. Um, so the 27th of February, the two flying boats went over, stayed the night, took off early the next morning, the first one arrived back in Broome. The second one never arrived, and that was the Cersei. Um, they did a big search the next day and never found any trace of the aeroplane, and for the next 70-plus years, nobody knew what had happened to it. And it was assumed, of course, that the Japanese had shot it down, but uh, there was no proof of that, despite quite a bit of searching after the war in various uh, Japanese records that we'd captured. They never found any evidence of what had happened to it. I'll, I'll come back to Cersei perhaps because the, the next bit of that story is interesting. But um, you mentioned the uh, Japanese air raid on Darwin and that, that occurred at the start of all of the, the broom stuff. So on the 19th of February 1942, the Japanese launched a massive air raid on Darwin. They launched aircraft off aircraft carriers, plus they sent other aircraft down from um, the parts of the Netherlands, East Indies that they'd captured already. And the object of the exercise was to neutralise Darwin as a base for operations while they, uh, essentially while they invaded Timor. So the invasion of Timor took place the night after the air raid, uh, which of course no one in Australia knew at the time. Um, so the air raid on the 19th of February 1942 air raid, and something a lot of people don't realise, the Japanese force that attacked was bigger than the force that attacked Pearl Harbour. So it was wow. a pretty significant air raid. And Darwin by that stage was kind of one of the main military locations well, certainly was the main military location in Australia. Uh, we'd reinforced it with a lot of troops, but also it was the jumping off point to the Netherlands East Indies, so there were a lot of 
uh, Arnabal Air Aircraft based there or passing through there, plus uh, all the US Air Force, Army Air Corps, or I guess as it was then, um, their aircraft passing through Darwin as well, going up into the Netherlands, East Indies, or even up into the Philippines. So there were still parts of the Philippines were hanging on, like Corregidor. Um So, yeah, Darwin was a pretty significant place, plus it was one of the few uh, deep water, all-weather ports uh, in that part of the world, so it was strategically quite important place. So the Japanese wanted to neutralise it. They sent over uh, a lot of aircraft in, in two, basically in two waves. Um, and among other things, there was a corner flying boat on the water at uh, Darwin at that time. Uh, in fact, <laughs> I'll talk about the civil aviation people because once again, you know, civilians in civil aviation were exposed to as much danger as service people. So the Air Force, there were two aerodromes in Darwin. Um, there was a civil aerodrome at Parap, uh, which was run by the Department of Civil Aviation, and the military aerodrome was just a couple of miles up the road, um, and that was run by the Royal Australian Air Force. They'd built it new, I think, in 1940, 41. The first part of the raid, uh, the air radio operators at aerodrome, the civ civilians, uh, they just happened to be outside and they could see some aircraft and they wondered what was going on because they hadn't heard anything about aircraft movements. <laughs> they realised then that they were Japanese aircraft and uh, they immediately jumped on the radio and sent out an air raid warning message. And that air raid warning message, which began with QQQ, was the, the thing like, like SOS, um, that air radio message uh, was, or the air raid warning message, I should say, was, was flashed down the air radio network to Melbourne, which is where the uh, um, Australian government was located in those days. And that was the first uh, knowledge that anyone outside of Darwin had that there was an air raid on Darwin, or the first air raid on, on the Australian mainland uh, sent by the civilian air radio operators. Um, so the air raid did a lot of damage, but in the, as part of that, um, there was a Qantas crew uh, at the hotel in Darwin um, of this flying boat that was moored in the harbour, and they wanted to save their aircraft at all costs. So the uh, captain and uh, first officer of the flying boat raced down to the harbour, um, got into a boat that took them out to the aircraft, and they did a quick pre-flight inspection, started the thing up, and eventually uh, took off uh, under the noses of the Japanese, and they flew the aeroplane out to Groot Island, that we talked about in part one, and uh, sat it out there. So it was quite a, an escape. And um, uh, in the meantime, the Japanese uh, had bombed the harbour. They did a huge amount of destruction. The air radio building had all its windows blown out. Um, the wharf that they used, there was a, a war, uh, sorry, a freighter there, I should say, called the Neptuna, and it was full of uh, ammunition and got set alight and then detonated uh, it was a huge explosion and the ship basically sank at the wharf and it was there till well after the war um, the wreck of the ship so blocking the, the wharf at Darwin the only one that they had back then um, so enormously destructive and as I said uh, uh, they sank ships in the harbour and there are other flying boats uh, military flying boats Catalonas there that were sunk and so on but um, the, the Cornus one got away as a uh, real sort of uh, escape adventure. Um, there's a great story, actually, too, of the, um, the uh, Qantas engineers had a boat that they used to take out to the flying boat and to service it, and then they got in their boat and they were going to go out to the aircraft, but as they were heading out, they saw it take off and disappear. But then they were out in the middle of Darwin Harbour when the Japanese came back to strafe the harbour, uh, and they were a bit concerned about being strafed by zeros. So they steered their boat into the mangroves on the other side of the harbour and sort of pulled it in as far as they could and then all got out of the boat because we only fairly shallow water there. 
and they hid in the mangroves until the Japanese had bugged off. Uh, and um, so they, they didn't want to make themselves a target either. So yeah, that was the, uh, the first air raid on Darwin. And then, as I said, um, a week later, we had the Cersei shot down off Java. So if you want to hear the, the story of how we worked out what happened to uh, Cersei, it's also yes, quite please, an interesting sir. thing. So as I said, for more than 70 years, everyone assumed it had been shot down. Nobody really knew. Um, and I was researching this particular story and I came across, uh, there was a huge saga, in fact, over the insurance because uh, I'm going to digress here again, but it's another fascinating uh, thing. So this is an example of how totally confused and, and sort of made up on the fly everything was. Um, the Qantas flying boats that were in Australia at the time. So when Singapore fell, some of the flying boats were west of Singapore and they went under BOAC control. And then all the ones that were east of Singapore retreated back to Australia and they came under Qantas control. I think there were only four of them, in fact. So as I said earlier, these were the sole heavy airlift available to the Allies. Even the Americans didn't have anything as big as the Empire flying boats in this part of the world at that time. Uh, so they were really valuable aircraft from a military point of view. And um, there was no, obviously no Empire Air Service to run anymore because that had been cut. So the uh, American authorities approached the Australian Department of Civil Aviation to take over the operation of these flying boats. And the man who did it was a chap by the name of Harold Gatty. Gatty will be familiar, a familiar name to many people. He was the navigator for Wiley Post when he did his round the world uh, flight in the Winnie May uh, in the, earlier in the 30s. So Gatty was a, uh, a navigator principally and he um, immigrated to the US and he'd uh, done some work over there for uh, Pan Am, I think. Uh, anyway, when the war began, Gatty was put in charge of air transport operations out in the Pacific, or at least for that part of it. So uh, Gatty, who was actually an Australian, I think it's a bit that I uh, overlooked mentioning, he was an Australian originally and had gone over to the States, came back to Australia. Um, the government made him a wing commander, I think, uh, in the Royal Australian Air Force, much to the disgust of the, the Air Force authorities because they didn't want him part of it. But he was given that rank so that he could, um, you know, throw his weight around to do his job because he was, um, I think he was Kenny's uh, air transport man. So he approached the Department of Civil Aviation to charter these flying boats. Um, they came up with a verbal agreement about uh, how these flying boats were used. And then the Department of Civil Aviation in turn told Qantas what they what they wanted them to do. So you had this kind of three-way chain. So Qantas technically owned the aeroplanes. Um, Department of Civil Aviation was telling them how to use them and they were being told in turn by Gaddy's, Gaddy and his crew uh, what they wanted them to do. So it was, a, it was a three-way thing. So the part of the verbal agreement was that the um, Americans would indemnify the loss of the flying boats uh, due to military action. Um, so none of this, as I said, all this happened so quickly because of the situation. None of it was put in writing until after the event, which is part of the problem. So the aeroplanes were normally insured on a joint policy between Qantas and Imperial Airways by British Aviation Insurance, uh, which was obviously based in the UK. And they had insured the, the aircraft. That was their um, you know, pre-war insurance. But they didn't cover any war risks as part of that insurance. So that was specifically excluded. So when the aeroplanes were being used for military uh, purposes, somebody had to assume that, that risk. And, and Gatti had said that they would do that. When Cersei was lost, um, Qantas went to the Department of Civil Aviation, who went to the Americans and said, well, the aeroplane was obviously shot down, uh, therefore 
you have to cover the cost of the, the loss. The Americans, on the other hand, said there's no evidence that it was shot down, so we're not responsible. Claim it from British Aviation Insurance. British Aviation Insurance said, well, obviously we're shot down, so we're not going to pay for it. <laughs> so, and this went on. I kid you not, there's inches and inches of files dealing with all of this. It went around and around and around for about 10 years, well into the post war <laughs> years, arguing about. Who was going to pay for the loss of this? Yeah. Having ar- having argued with insurance adjusters, I'm surprised it only lasted for ten years. <laughs> yeah, well, yeah. Eventually, um, I gave up trying to get the money out of the Americans, and British Aviation Insurance copped it. But they then said, "Well, we're not going to insure any of the Qantas aircraft again." So there was that. Uh, anyway. Going back to how we found out about Cersei, uh, I happened to be reading one of these files and there was a report in there that um, the insurers had commissioned somebody to go through the Japanese archives that we got access to, obviously, at the end of the war um, to see what they could find out about the loss of the aircraft. And there's just a little snippet in there that caught my eye that said there was a radio broadcast claiming that uh, this is from, from a Japanese radio uh, station um, claiming that a four-engine flying boat had been shot down by fighters based in Java. Oh, sorry, not in Java, in Bali, which is an island off Java. Very popular holiday destination for Australians these days. But Bali was actually captured by the Japanese before Java itself fell and they based uh, aircraft there. So I thought this is an interesting clue if it's true. And of course, there's no indication it was. Um, and I happened to get onto a, uh, a, a website. Um, I was looking at it at the time uh, called jaircraft.com, which is a fabulous website. Uh, it's basically a big discussion forum, and there's a lot of other information on it. Um, a lot of really knowledgeable people about Japanese military aviation on there, including people who can read Japanese. Now, I knew that the Japanese, a lot of the Japanese operations records had been made available online fairly recently. Um, But the problem is uh, they're written in Japanese and I don't speak Japanese. And as it turns out, not only are they written in Japanese, but they're written in uh, uh, an archaic form of Japanese that modern Japanese people, not all of them, can read. Um, so a bit like um, some of those old German texts you see in Gothic letters, they can be pretty hard to read. A similar kind of idea, I think, uh, and I don't pretend to be an expert on it. Anyway, I knew that there were a few people on this forum that could read those records. So I put a post on there and I said, this is what I've found. You know, Could somebody go and have a look at the appropriate records um, and see what you can find. And within about a day and a half, I had a message back from a chap called Sam Tagaya, who's a, an author and quite a well-known uh, researcher on, on uh, Japanese military aviation. And he said, I think I've found what you're looking for. Uh, and it turned out that he had found a combat record from a Japanese uh, bomber, a Japanese Naval Air Force bomber squadron they were based in Bali, and they were um, their aircraft were tasked with doing maritime patrols out over the Indian Ocean. They were looking for shipping, trying to get between or escape from uh, Java back to Australia at the time. And uh, this combat report said that they'd encountered a four-engine flying boat and it gave a position and a time, uh, and they'd shot it down into the sea. So this obviously looked pretty promising, but then the next step was to try and confirm that that was, in fact, Cersei, that that was Richie Ditch. So in the Australian files regarding uh, the disappearance of Cersei, there was some information about when they departed and so on, and there was also details of the aircraft that preceded her by a few minutes, what time they departed and also what time they arrived at Broome. And that allowed me to calculate a ground speed. And I knew the track that they were flying because it was in the file as well. And I was able to calculate uh, an intercept or what time the 
because we knew where the uh, bomber had shot down the aircraft at what time. And I was able to work out that, in fact, the two things were the same and that it was, in fact, Cersei that she had shot down. So it was a pretty pretty interesting process. And, and all of that was actually more difficult than it seems because there's a whole bunch of different time zones used in the different reports. So everything first had to be converted back to a, a standard time zone. And that's why we use UTC and aviation because <laughs> otherwise it'd be a nightmare and this was exactly why um, so i had to convert everything to a standard time reference and then i was able to do the calculations from there and prove that the two events were the same thing so um now we know and the the best part of all of that and i want to say best part but you know a tragic event of course um when i'd done that i put my conclusions in my work on up online and um, a few days later I had a message from a chap who said I'm the nephew of the co-pilot of the flying boat and we have been wondering what happened to our uncle for years and years and years and it's great to have finally found out and so on and he said and the co-pilot's daughter is still alive and she lives in Sydney so I got in touch with her and we've subsequently become good friends. And uh, you know, I think they were very, very happy to find out, what, or she was happy to find out what happened to her dad. But it's that human part of the story that made it so rewarding. It's, um, you know, having been able to explain that and to the family. And I've also had contact with the family. The passengers on the flying boat were actually mostly a, a bunch of Dutch diplomats and their families. Um, and I've been in touch with some of them uh, families and also there was a US naval officer as well on the flying boat and I've been in touch with his family as well so that's uh, I guess one of the rewarding parts of you know being a historian and uh, you know that, as I said the human side of the story uh, is, is the most rewarding part of it so there you go yeah. So let's let's wrap up really. So basically all the the bits we've been talking about for the war is is the first few months heading into things starting to calm down a little bit in in later 42. When does things start returning to normal as as the allies push the Japanese north and Egypt opens up again and 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 things like that. Do the flying boat services restart in any any way, shape, or form before the end of the war? They do. Probably one more event that's worth talking about, and that was occurred a few days after the loss of Cersei. So after Cersei disappeared, the Australian authorities went, no, that's it. We're not going to risk any more of these valuable aircraft uh, on a, you know, what was evidently by then a lost cause. Uh, so they told Qantas to withdraw everything back to Sydney. However, they were still packing up all their stuff a couple of days later, on the 3rd of March, when, if you remember, I said that Broome had become a huge hub of aviation activity at that time, uh, and the Japanese had obviously worked that out, and they launched an air raid uh, from with uh, some aircraft out of Timor, uh, fighters. Um, the Australian authorities really didn't believe or hadn't believed that they could launch an air raid over such a distance, but they did. And they turned up over Broome. There were dozens of aircraft on the aerodrome and on the harbour, flying boats, and they strafed them all and sank. I I can't remember their total number now, but it was about 13 flying boats and shot down a Liberator and destroyed other aircraft on the airfield. So it was a huge disaster. These were all, you know, really valuable aircraft. So one of the Qantas flying boats was still there, Corinna. And also one of the uh, RAAF chartered Empire flying boats was there, the Centaurus, which is actually the first one that had ever come to Australia back in 1938. Um, They were sunk at their moorings. Um, A lot of these flying boats, particularly the Dutch ones, had refugees on board. Because there was no way to get them off the flying boats because the boats were very limited in Broome at the time, uh, and also accommodation in town and so on was pretty limited as well. 
they spent the night on the flying boat. The Japanese turn up early in the morning the next day, shot, uh, sunk all these flying boats, and there were a lot of uh, casualties of uh, civilians, uh, refugees as well. So it was a, it was a huge disaster. Um, <clears throat> and that kind of rules a line under that period of the war. Uh, Qantas withdrew everything back to Sydney, and they were employed operating after a week or so of, of reorganising. They were employed running services up to Darwin, uh, and their basic job was ferrying military equipment and personnel up to Darwin and back. Now, they did actually lose about a, uh, a few weeks after that. They lost another one of their flying boats, so we've, we're whittling the fleet away pretty quickly at this point. Um, the Corinthian was one of the Imperial Airways boats that was trapped on this side of the route. Um, they were doing a night alighting in Darwin Harbour. No one knows even to this day exactly what happened, but I suspect they hit some debris in the in the harbour and um, punched a hole in the hull and the aeroplane sank in the harbour. Uh, there was a couple of American service people killed, but that, that was kind of it. So they carried on with that. The threat to Darwin, there were more air raids and they continued on for a few years, but basically the... The main threat to Darwin sort of dissipated after that. Um, and shortly afterwards, the Japanese uh, turned their attention towards New Guinea. And um, people may be familiar with the whole story of the Kokoda track and so on. Mm-hmm. It was pretty desperately fought battles in sort of early to mid-1942. Um, and the flying boats were largely used to reinforce uh, New Guinea South operated services from uh, Sydney or Brisbane up to uh, New Guinea. Uh, they were involved in the defence of Milne Bay, which was on the very eastern uh, end of New Guinea. Uh, another great battle. In fact, that was the first time uh, the Allies won a victory over over the Japanese, over a Japanese invasion was at Milne Bay. They were able to repulse their invasion there. Uh, and the Qantas empires were operating into Milne Bay once again, you know, they're flown by civilians, civilian people at the Crown, the, the bases uh, in Port Moresby and elsewhere. Um, no medals, no recognition, but just as much danger as any of the service people there. Um, so that's pretty much it. Uh, the rest of the war was basically just transport flights. Um, in 1943, the Qantas were able to get back their aeroplanes uh, their flying boats from the Air Force um, because the Ardabai effort started to take deliveries of large numbers of Catalunas and also uh, Martin Mariners, which they were using for transport. So they, they were able to release the Empire flying boats back to Qantas. And Qantas only had one by that time, so they were glad to get uh, their two of their flying boats back. But then they lost a couple more in accidents. And by the end of the war, there was only one left. Um, poor old uh, Coriolanus, which was um, a lone survivor, uh, carried on. Uh, soon after the war, Imperial Airways, like these flying boats, they they kept pounding up and down the route for years during the war, the latter part of the war, uh, and they all had really, really hard lives. And by the end of the war, they were pretty well knackered. And, of course, there were bigger, better aeroplanes had come along. Plus, lots of aerodromes had been expanded to the point where large land planes could use them, um, which wasn't the case uh, in the pre-war years, and that was the reason why we'd had the flying bird service in the first place, or one of the reasons. Um, so there was no need for these poor old Empire flying boats, and BIAC withdrew and scrapped these pretty quickly after the war. Qantas kept Coriolanus going till 1947. Um, in the later part of it, she was used up in on service up to Fiji through Noumea. Uh, once again, you know there weren't land aerodromes uh, available in some of these places, so the flying boats still had a bit of a role to play. But um, really, Coriolanus became an orphan. Um, I haven't talked about New Zealand, but Tran- uh, Tasman Empire Airways Limited or Teal got two Empire flying boats in 1940 and they used them across the Tasman 
uh, that was the final connection in this part of the world on the Empire Airmail scheme, but it didn't, uh, not the Empire Airmail scheme because that had been cancelled by the time they started, but the Empire Air route, I should say. Um, they were special long range uh, versions of the Empire boats, uh, but they were also retired fairly shortly after the war. Anyway, uh, Coriolanus, one of the, the, the Qantas engineers, a bloke by the name of George Roberts, tried to buy it from Qantas. Um, he was going to keep it on his property somewhere, I think. Um, but Qantas wouldn't sell it to him, and instead uh, they broke it up in 1948. And uh, she was the uh, the last operational Empire flying boat anywhere when uh, she was taken out of service. So it's a bit tragic. You know, they, they were designed and brought in for a particular purpose. They served for a year, didn't really live to see the full potential, but during the war they gave absolutely sterling uh, service in uh, in what they were doing. And, uh, you know, the Empire's communications would have been a lot less... Um, a lot less uh, effective without the Empire flying boats, that's for sure. So a tragedy that none of them were ever preserved, I think. Yeah, it's it's one of those things with hindsight, you look back and maybe maybe they could have done something. But again, it was a knackered old airplane, wasn't it? it with, 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 with new and wonderful things coming in at the end of the war i suppose like with all of these things people saying yep typhoon should have been saved we should have saved one of every type all, all of that business people were looking forward weren't they and they they were yeah, trying desperately hard not to look right. back exactly the same thing it's just so people wanted to look forward they wanted to put the war behind them and you know bigger shinier airplanes coming along plus you know materials were in short supply so you know scrapping and recycling the the materials was was important so um, it's just, you know, from our perspective now, many years later, uh, a bit sad that they didn't at least keep one, but there you go. Phil, this has been utterly fascinating. And I, my, my mind just can't get by how compressed a timeline this really is. You know, the, the initial services out to Australia, down, down to Africa, only really operated at their full weight for less than a year. And before being repurposed into so many different things. And it's, as as, as, as we've made fun, there's a lot to talk about, even in that sort of short 10-year period before the last one was gone. So thank you so much for spending all this time with us. It's been very kind of you. It's a pleasure. I hope your listeners find it interesting. And, you know, I... Uh, I find the whole story endlessly interesting. There's just so many facets to it and the people did so much. I I really wish that I'd at least been able to talk to the people who operated them. They, they were all gone by the time I started getting interested. But by golly, there's some fascinating stories. Thank you so much. Thank you. I cannot thank Phil enough for his time to go through the incredible story of the Qantas Empire flying boats and all that amazing research that he's done for what is an incredible service that only lasted for such a short period of time, like a year. I highly recommend you checking out the Airways Museum website. There's just a wealth of information. Also, you can check out Phil's articles in the Aviation Historian, which is a superb quarterly magazine who have been silly enough to let even the likes of me write for them. But Phil's articles are in Aviation Historian 9, 11, 31, 32. Link in the description below, as are the other bits to Phil, the Airways Museum and everything in there. So please do check out his work. And please let us know what you've thought about this three-parter, which was supposed to be a two-parter, but as you can see, there's a lot to talk about. So thank you, as always, for your support of the pod. It's been great to see the numbers going up. So if you're new, please do check out all the old episodes as well, including that first part with Phil, if this is your very first episode. If you like it, tell your friends. That's the best way to spread the love for the pod. Leave some stars and a review in your podcast app of choice. If you're on Apple Podcasts, just pop some stars in. It really does the world of good to the algorithms, which we all know are taking over the world. As always, hello to our AI overlords. 
And of course, if you want to join us on Patreon, where you'll have early access to all the episodes, a lot of the videos that we have coming from the Pima Air and Space Museum as well are going to be shown up there first. As always, thank you to Pima for their continued sponsorship of the pod. But if you want to get this stuff ad-free, early, some extra bits, ramblings from me, that's on the Patreon, link in the description below. It starts at just £3 a month plus a bit of that. You get a thank you card from me in my own handwritten scroll. It's great. But you don't have to do that. Just tell your friends. Everything's ace. As always, thank you, thank you, thank you for listening. We've got some fun stuff coming up. I'm moving house as well, so that we might miss an episode. I don't know yet. I'll let you know. But until then, please do take care of yourselves. Thank you for listening. Bye-bye. The Damcasters is hosted and produced by Matt Bow and is a Bony Abroad podcast production. To learn more about our podcast and check out our previous episodes, head to www.thedamcasterspod.com.